Sunday of the month of August. The fact that we're still here, it is a blessing in itself. Many started in August, but have not and will not finish in August. But we are still here, and we bless his holy name. If you will, turn your attention with me to the book of Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Familiar passage of scripture, we want to share this with you all as the Lord leads us and praying that you will receive it and be blessed by it. Acts chapter number 13. And when you're there, say amen. Amen. Acts chapter 13. Verse number 1. Acts 13 and verse 1. It says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, Simeon, that was called Niger or Neger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work, whereunto I have called them. And when they had prayed and fasted and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. I want to go back to verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Right. And when they had laid, yes. fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Uh, you may be seated. Amen. I want to take a few moments and share with you from this the scriptures, something that we all need, and that's direction for our destiny. Amen. Direction for destiny. Now, I really need y'all to stay with me because I want to take my time with this and really teach this the way I really need to. Amen. All right. All right. All right. Acts chapter 13 starts out by identifying five of the prophets and teachers that were a part of the church at Antioch. Uh -huh. The text says these five were Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius or Lucius, Manian, and Saul. Now, if you take a moment and look in Acts chapter 11, verse 24, it is there that you will read where it says, Barnabas was a good man, mm -hmm. one that was full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith. That was Barnabas. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what's interesting about Manian is the fact that the text says that he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Now, this particular Herod the Tetrarch, this was Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was one of the sons of Herod the Great. Herod Antipas, he inherited a fourth part of his father's kingdom or his father's domain. That's why he is also called Herod the Tetrarch. Okay. Now, Herod Antipas, he was so evil 
that he even married his brother's wife. But not only did he marry his brother's wife, but it was this Herod Antipas that ordered the execution of John the Baptist by having John's head cut off. Now, this same Herod Antipas, according to Luke chapter 23, verse 11, he, along with his soldiers, treated Jesus with contempt or disdain or disrespect, and they mocked Jesus and arrayed him with a robe and then had Jesus sent back to Pilate to try him and sentence him. I want to say this. The text says that Manion was brought up with this same Herod, this same Herod Antipas. Right. If Manion was brought up then with this evil man named Herod Antipas, Manion could have been influenced to follow in the same evil steps as Herod did. However, though, somewhere along the way, Manion was introduced to the truth. And when Manion was introduced to the truth, it made him free. And eventually, Manion became a leader in the Christian church. Specifically, according to the text, he was a teacher or a prophet of the Lord. So again, this Manion that was raised up with the evil Herod Antipas, instead of Manion following in the steps of Herod Antipas or doing the things associated with Herod Antipas, at some point, Manion, again, he got connected to the truth. And once he realized the truth, he became free and became a leader in the early Christian church. Now, if you look at the text, verse 1, the text also identifies Saul as a teacher or prophet at the church in Antioch as well. Right. Now, you know this, that Saul had been a persecutor of the church. That's right. As a matter of fact, in, eight, in Acts chapter 8, verse 3, it says that Saul made havoc of the church. Entering into every house and hailing or dragging men and women to prison, all because of their belief in Jesus Christ. That's right. That's right. But in Acts chapter 9, after Saul had had an encounter with Jesus himself, it is then that change came to Saul. As a matter of fact, Jesus had to temporarily, physically blind Saul in order for Saul to see spiritually. And now this same Saul who is now changed, this same Saul who was once a persecutor of the church, now this same Saul is now an ambassador for Christ. And according to verse number one, he is a teacher or a prophet in the early church at Antioch. Now I want you to see this. The text also identifies Simeon and Lucius. Now if you look at the text, the text says that Lucius or Lucius was from Cyrene or Cyrene. Now Cyrene was a city in North Africa to the northwest of Libya. This means then that Lucius was a man of African descent. He was a black man. This black man was a teacher or a prophet in the early church. I want you to see this for yourself again. This man, Lucius, he was from Cyrene or Cyrene, which was a city in North Africa to the northwest of Libya. So that means then this man was of African descent. In other words, he was a black man that functioned as a teacher or a prophet in the early Christian church. Amen. Amen. But 
Not only was Lucius a black man, but Simeon was a black man as well. The text says Simeon was also called Neger. Watch this now, Neger of Niger. Now what's interesting, now hear this now, Neger of Niger also means black. Now what's interesting about this is, the Strong's Dictionary, it pronounces this word Neger. But in the Castlebooks Dictionary, it is pronounced Niger. Now for the sake of clarity, just suppose it is pronounced neger. Well, Not nigger, but neger, uh -huh. which is its Latin derivative. Again, the Latin derivative is neger, which means black. Watch this now. It was never meant to be anything derogatory. It was just simply terminology for the color. All right. All right. Now, let me just help you a little bit for comparison's sake. If you go back to Genesis chapter 25, it is there that we can take a look at Esau. Esau was the brother of Jacob. Right. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 25 that when Esau was born, he came out red all over like a hairy garment. And later on in that same chapter 25 of Genesis, Esau's name was changed to Edom. Now, Edom means red. It fits Esau not only because he had a red complexion, but one day as he had gotten older, he had come in from the field. And because he was so tired and weak, and he saw his brother Jacob cooking red pottage, he asked Jacob to feed him with the red pottage that he was cooking. And the text says his name was called Edom, which means red. Now let me point this out now. Esau, the text says, was a skillful hunter. He was a man of the field. Therefore, when his name was changed to Edom, it had nothing to do with his craft. All right, now. All right. When his name was changed to Edom, it had nothing to do with his character. When his name was changed to Edom, it had nothing to do with his culture. When his name was changed to Edom, it had nothing to do with his credibility. When his name was changed to Edom, it was simply because of his complexion, and that's all. all, right. all right. So in like manner, Simeon called Neger, he was called Neger, capital N, proper noun, simply because of his complexion. Right. Not because of his character, not because of his culture, not because of his class, not because of his credibility, not because of his craft, but simply because of his complexion. Yeah, Amen. Amen. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Furthermore, then, for the Bible to identify black men as leaders in the early church, not only does it show the black man's value. Come on, now. Come on, now. Let me pause right there for a second. Again, if you look at this, there's nothing derogatory at all. Nothing derogatory at all. Uh -huh. It was simply signified complexion, not culture, not class, not character, not credibility, not craft, but simply complexion. All right. And for the Bible to identify black men as leaders in the early church, not only does it show the black man's value, but in comparison to today's society, we also see how much the black man's value has been misplaced and in some cases diminished. Let me back up say it again. We see then, again, how valuable the black man was in the early church. 
But the sad thing is, when we look at society today, again, the black man's value has been misplaced, and in a lot of cases, the black man's value has been diminished. And a lot of it, brothers and sisters, is attributed to slavery, white supremacy, racism. And also a lot of it is also attributed to improper teachings and false doctrines. Therefore, a lot of our black men don't come to church. A lot of them seek other means for validation. A lot of them just don't realize how valuable they are to the Lord and to the church. Think about how many black men in your family don't come to church. Talk back to me, somebody. Black men that you know and love and yet don't come to church. They don't understand how valuable the black man was in the early church. And because of improper teachings and false doctrines, a lot of black men today don't see a need for the church. Now, understanding that black men were also pillars in the early church, but because of false doctrine, improper teaching, because the word was taken out of context through slavery, a lot of our black men have sought their worth in other means, have sought their worth in other doctrines. That's why there are so many black men today that simply have denounced the church of the living God. Amen. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying here? Amen. That's why you got so many black men that follow the nation of Islam. That's why you got so many black men that follow Rastafarianism. That's why you got so many black men that follow all these other religious beliefs, all because they don't understand their history. They don't know that black men had a place in the early church. Black men were leaders in the early church. Black men had a connection to God. Black men were used by the Lord to do great things in the early church, but because somewhere along the way there have been some false doctrines, some false teaching, black men have lost their way. Think about all the black men in your family that don't come to church, that don't believe in God, that don't see a need for God, don't see a need for church. Think that if the long as they just make money, they'll be all right. If they just have a good job, they'll be all right. Now, understanding that we need the Lord and we have a place in the church of God. Sisters, Lucius, Simeon, black leaders in the early church, uh-huh. black Christians, well, black disciples, yeah. black teachers, black prophets in the early church. Uh-huh. It's right here in the Bible. Well, but think about brothers and sisters again. How many of our own black people? Will do anything but come to church. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Will find a reason not to come to church. Yeah, will go everywhere else except come to church. Yeah, will do everything else but come to church. Yeah. Will find something to do on Sunday morning just to not come to church. Yeah. Talk back to me, somebody. If I'm talking about your black men, you ought to just say amen and ask God to help them out because our black men need some help. If I'm talking to the right folk in here today, if you all got some black men in your that you know need the Lord. You want to say, Lord, save my black man. Save my brother. Save my daddy. Save my uncle. Save my son. Save my nephew. Save my brother. Lord, save the black man in my family. Show them their worth in my God. Touch my black man. five men there's so much diversity and yet so much commonality at the same time they come from different backgrounds but now they share the same goal 
They had different experiences in life. And yet here they are now, prophets and teachers of the Lord, leading and guiding God's people. Amen. Amen. Sister, can I tell you something? The Lord doesn't judge you based on your background. He doesn't judge you based on your past experiences. He does not judge you based on the color of your skin. He simply judges you based on your faith and your faithfulness. In other words, what you believe and what you do. Can I tell you, brothers and sisters, he can use you despite what you've done or who you've done it with. He can use you despite how others feel about you or what others think of you. As a matter of fact, sometimes he'll use you because of your background. Sometimes he'll use you because of your experiences. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. Uh -huh. Because God has a way of, of sanctifying you and you in that same zeal that you had for over there. And now use that zeal for his kingdom and use that zeal for his purposes. Sometimes God would purposely look for some folk that been through some stuff. He don't always just use the stock free clean folk all the time. Right. Sometimes he'll use some folk that done messed up real bad. Right. Sometimes he'll use some folk that went down the wrong road. Yeah. Sometimes he'll use people that made some mistakes in their lives. Because those people know what it means to be humble. They, they know that the change that they are experiencing is only because of the Lord. And those people know how to relate to other people. Those Sometimes he uses you to 
despite your experiences, but then there are times that you should be cause of your experiences. The Bible says in verse 2 that as they ministered unto the Lord and as they fasted, the Holy Ghost spoke. All right, then. All right, then. Look right here in the text. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. In other words, as they served the Lord, right. as they worshiped the Lord, as they worshiped through service, and as they fasted, the Holy Ghost spoke. Glory to God. So, sisters, let me interject this. This has a similar theme as last week's message. For in last week's text, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, after Jehoshaphat prayed and fasted, if you go down to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 14, it says, Then upon Jehaziel came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation, and he began to speak. Again, it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 14, Then upon Jehaziel came the Lord in the midst of the congregation, and he began to speak. After Jehoshaphat prayed and fasted, the Holy Ghost showed up, and he spoke. The sisters, even in that same body of scriptures in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, in verse 16, the Holy Ghost spoke and gave information. Yes, it did. In verse 17, he spoke and gave instruction. Uh-huh. In verse 18, he spoke and gave inspiration. Yes. And now in today's text, because of worship and fasting, the Spirit shows up and speaks again. Yeah. He said to them, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, uh-huh. for the work whereunto I have called them. Right, now, brothers and sisters, let me pause to say this. There are a lot of voices in the world. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And sometimes we give our ear to the wrong voices. If we give our ear to the wrong voices, we end up making the wrong decisions because of the wrong voices. Are y'all hear what I'm saying in here? That's why it's important for you and I to be discerning. So we can know who are we listening to. Who is speaking at that moment in time? Is what they're saying doesn't line up with the word of God. Or is what they say contrary to the word of God. Now, brothers and sisters, that being said, can I tell you something? Yes, Sometimes I found out that people really do have your best interests at heart. However, just because what they are telling you is coming from a good place, it still may contradict God's will for your life. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying in here? Even though what they are saying to you, it may be coming from a good place, but it still may contradict God's will for your life. That's why it's important for you to know the voice of God. For when you know his voice, it is then that you are able to discern which voice you need to take heed to. Oh, listen to me in here. Can I tell you something else, brothers and sisters? It is dangerous to not know the voice of God. 
I'm going to say it again. It is dangerous to not know the voice of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, it says there are false apostles, deceitful workers, who transform themselves as apostles of Christ. Furthermore, it says that Satan himself transforms as an angel of light. Therefore, brothers and sisters, when you don't know the voice of God, you will literally believe anybody that calls themselves disciples and ministers for Christ. I tell you something, the devil will use their titles, he will use their positions, and use their charisma to lead you in the wrong direction. Amen. Are y'all hear what I'm saying in here? Amen. Again, the text says there are false apostles, deceitful workers who transform themselves as apostles of Christ. In other words, they are deceitful, they are false, they are not of God, but they make themselves appear to be followers of Christ. They talk like they are followers of Christ. They know all of the Christian matter. They know what the When folk are chased behind people because of their titles. Talk back to me, somebody. That's why it bothers me. You're always chased behind Pastor So and so. You're chased behind Bishop So and so. You're chased behind Apostle So and so. You're chasing titles, but you don't know if they are real or not. You're just going by the title. You're going by the charisma, but you don't realize the devil transformed as an angel of life. so much stuff and I also know the word of God and I know what the devil would do to those that don't know the word of God to those people that are so desperate that they'll follow anybody just to uh, have their own agenda accomplished those people don't realize that the devil is setting them up chasing behind people Going from church to church. Chasing people. You ain't chasing God. You're chasing people. That's why some of you are not going because you're chasing people and not chasing God. That's why so many of you are not walking in your calling because you're chasing the people. You're not chasing God. That's why so many of you get so easily offended because you're chasing people. You're not chasing God. But when you learn to chase God, you can learn to blossom what you're planted at. I know my sheep, mm -hmm. 
and my sheep know me. But sisters, we need the Lord to speak to us. And when he speaks, we need to know his voice. Because a lot of times he speaks, but we don't know who it is that's talking. Because we got so many voices in our ears. And because we're not discerning enough to know whose voice belongs to who. And so we start moving at the wrong voices and end up moving out of the will of God for our lives. The sisters, the text says, they ministered to the Lord, they fasted, and then the Holy Ghost spoke. And the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work where to I have called them. Well, Can I ask a question, brothers and sisters? How many here need the Lord to speak to them? Amen. Amen. Anybody here that really need the Lord to speak to them? Yes, if you need the Lord to speak to you, lift your hand high in the air. Maybe you need direction for your ministry. Well, Maybe you need direction for your marriage. Maybe you need direction for your money. Maybe you're faced with a career decision. Or maybe you're faced with a midlife crisis. Maybe you're faced with a decision concerning your health. Maybe you're faced with a complex business decision. Maybe you're at the crossroad of life and you're wondering, do I stay or do I go? Do I do this or do I do that? And maybe right now there's so much obscurity that you just don't know what to do. Maybe you're trying to weigh the pros and the cons. Maybe you're trying to weigh the risks and the rewards. Uh And right now, you're stuck. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, real quick. If you're stuck, what you don't need to do is get advice from folk on Facebook. Are y'all hear what I'm saying here? I know I'm talking about 65% of y'all. Can I tell you also, you don't need to know how your mom and daddy will handle the situation. I know you love your mama and your daddy, but can I tell you something? Your mom and daddy don't know everything. Talk back to me, somebody. Can I tell you what you need? You need a word from the Lord. You need the Holy Ghost to speak to you. In order for you to walk in your divine calling, you need the Holy Ghost to speak to you. In order for you to be the servant the Lord needs you to be, you need the Holy Ghost to speak to you. In order for you to be the leader the church needs you to be, you need the Holy Ghost to speak to you. In order for you to be the light that shines in this dark world, you need the Holy Ghost to speak to you. In order for you to be the husband that your wife needs, you need the Holy Ghost to speak to you. In order for you to be the wife that your husband needs, you need the Holy Ghost.
house will lead you to where you need to be. So you can prosper in that place. The place where you can blossom. Be fruitful and be a blessing to those that you encounter along the way. Now as I close, brothers and sisters, listen what the text says. It says, when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, then they sent them away. As I told you, brothers and sisters, on last week, fasting is not about affliction. It's about discipline, devotion, and direction. I believe somebody here today desperately needs the Holy Ghost to speak to them. Some of you are now walking in your calling because you have no clarity. Some of you are not fulfilling the purpose of where you are because you have no clarity. Some of you are stuck in a rut because you keep giving heed to the wrong voices. Brothers and sisters, when the Holy Ghost spoke concerning Barnabas and Saul, Uh keep this in mind. When he spoke concerning Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul were connected to people that were connected to the Lord. Not only did Barnabas and Saul know the Lord, but the folk that they were working with, Simeon, Lucius, and Manion, all of them knew the Lord as well. Uh All of them were able to hear the voice of the Spirit and it confirmed the new assignment that the Lord had for Barnabas and Saul. Sisters, if you need the Lord to show you what to do, pray. Uh Uh-huh. Worship, fast, devote to him, delight in him, discipline for him, so you can hear what he has to say. If you're going to get the direction that you need for your destiny, you have to learn to devote to him, delight in him, discipline for him. Pray, worship fast so when he speaks you will hear and discern. And that wherever he leads you you will follow, you will go because you will then be in the right place the place where you can blossom be fruitful, multiply and bless those that come your way. Brothers and sisters I don't know what the Lord has with each person in this room. Uh Uh-huh. But I do know he has something for each person in this room. That's right. Some of you, again, desperately need some direction. Uh-huh. Where you are right now in your life, you have some major decisions that you have to make. Some of you are getting ready to step into some places you've never stepped in before. And you need some direction, you need some instruction, you even need some inspiration. All right, man. I'm telling you now. He is willing to speak, but are you willing to listen? Come on, he is willing to speak, but do you know his voice? Have you prepared yourself uh-huh. to hear what he has to say? All right, man. All right. Have you positioned yourself to hear what he has to say? Brothers and sisters, he'll give you direction for your destiny. There's no doubt about that. For we all have a destiny in him. The question is, do you want to go where he sends you? Do you want to do what he tells you to do? Amen. Are you ready for that next place, that next step, that next level? Are you ready? Do you even know what it is? Do you even know what he is saying? Do you even know his voice? 
maybe you're at a place, brothers and sisters, where you are at this crossroad. Maybe you are in a place where there is so much obscurity, so much vagueness. Maybe you are at a place where you can't see clearly, you can't hear clearly, you don't know what to do. Maybe you are allowing the wrong people to whisper in your ear and what you think is good advice is actually transformed. It, it sounds like good advice, mm -hmm. but the devil is actually using it to draw you away from what God wants you to be. But because it sounds good and because it makes you feel good, uh -huh. you will take heed to it, not realize that it's only a setup mm -hmm. to bring you down. Sisters, you need to hear what he has to say. Amen. You need the Lord. Yes, sir. I need the Lord. We need direction Amen. for our lives, individually and collectively. Amen. Amen. You need direction for you, uh -huh. and you need direction for your household. Amen. You need to hear what the Spirit has to say. All right. Because the truth is, we don't know everything. But he does. Yes, sir. Yes, so why not listen? He'll make it worth our while. There are so many benefits to listening and heeding what he has to say. He'll give you direction for your destiny, just like he did Barnabas and Saul. There is no respect of persons with the Lord. What he did for them, he'll do for you. Yes, he will. He'll give you direction for your destiny. He'll show you where you need to go. Yes, he will. He'll tell you what you need to do. Amen. He'll make it plain to you. And he'll even confirm it amongst those that know him and know his voice. He'll bring you confirmation. Yes, he will. If you're here today 